Hello, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage here in New York City for AWS Summit. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE, and Zias Carvella is here, part of our CUBE Collective, also principal and owner of ZK Research, uh, Zias. Uh, it's a becoming a tradition that you come on with the keynotes. We're going to have Sarjeet come on later with Stack Payne to give his analysis, but you know, we, we do this keynote analysis every time. It's almost like a tradition. Yes. <laughs> great, to get your, tradition. great to get your perspective. Look, at I mean, you, we've just been traveling around. You go to a lot of the events, you see the keynotes. This is kind of a quasi-monster event because it's like a summit for yeah. Amazon. It's not reInvent, but it's New York City. It's a ground zero for all the action and finance, Wall Street, but also there's a ton of developer community building out here. You're seeing the VCs from California come here. It's a heavy AI culture here in New York. We've all been seeing it for years, but now it seems to be popping really hard on all cylinders here in New York. So uh, it's not just FinTech or these ad tech areas where there's real-time information and, and low latency like how about Genevieve AI is bringing a whole nother wave. And so in the keynote today, you heard Matt Wood. What's your analysis? Yeah, well, you know, they call this AWS Summit in New York. They should call it Gen AI Summit because all the content was about that. And I felt like this was the year Matt really laid down the hammer. You know, we are the Gen AI company. I think if you look at a lot of the media coverage of Gen AI, people have written that AWS has fallen behind, Microsoft stole on the show or whatever. And I think he used the platform to really establish the fact that AWS is not just a, a participant in the Gen AI wars, right? They are the leader in it. In fact, he put up some good data points that uh, over the last year they had 236 updates, I think it was, the, the number was, which mm -hmm. he said was more than all the other cloud companies combined, right? And then he rolled out customer after customer, NASDAQ, uh, Bear, uh, there was one other customer about what they were trying to do with it. Uh, I recently just talked to Rocket Mortgage as well. They've built their whole platform on it. They're doing a session here. So I think between the customers he had on stage and a lot of the data points they gave and a lot of the innovation they rolled out, um, you know, Matt Wood's point is we're not just playing in the Gen AI space, we're leading it. And you know, if cloud is indeed the platform for Gen AI, then you know, rightfully so, that you know they've been the leader in the cloud really since its inception, and that would make sense. Yeah, a couple observations on my end. One, Swami was not here last year. Yeah. He has the keynote. the um, The size of the event was smaller. Remember, last year was kind of a it was packed house. Remember the long lines. Yeah, I think they. I'm not sure about this. I'm going to check on the reporting on this to get more detail. But I think they might have curtailed the registration. So that a lot of the homeless yeah. didn't come in and have yeah, protesting. We had a lot of protesters last year. Last so, year was yeah. a lot of protests. Yeah. So again, um, instant free, pretty much here. Um, on Matt and Matt's been around for a while, pre being the the poster child for the Gen AI. Um, he's been spearheading a lot of those stuff with Swami back in the day. I yeah. remember those interviews we did in the Cube. Did you think that he kind of hit the mark, but on the consumer side as well, or developer side? Because they, clearly, you know, with Q, I mean, they, they seem to be double down on Q. I, I, I get it, but it's like not everyone needs Q, right? They need yeah. the, the models, right? And I, I think he hit a home run with the models merging, models interacting. I thought that was something we've been reporting on the Cube for over a year now that models would interact. But was it too enterprisey? Um, and was there any hope for developers? Like the classic startup, I saw a startup in the hallway here, it's like, I'm doing a startup. Um, I don't need VCF for VMware to run, automate Kubernetes. I'm doing my own thing. Yeah. I don't really need Q. Like, so what's the, what was your takeaway in terms of the percentage of enterprise content versus say, pure developer? Yeah, it was interesting because developer was there, but it was at the tail end of it, right? And then he gave some data points around Code Whisperer and, and uh, how that's been used to uh, it, with Gen AI to help write code faster, but I did think it actually took a back seat to a lot of the enterprise things. He, he talked a lot about models, and I, I think their approach to Gen AI has been, there isn't one model to rule them all, they're going to be open, they're going to take more of a platform approach, but uh, I, I think to answer your question on developer, uh, it was represented, yeah. but not as heavily you're right, as it, as it could have been, and it, and it was at the tail end of that keynote. So they weren't yeah. leading with developer. I mean, I'm not a big, I mean, I like the code assistant thing, don't get me wrong, I love that, but that's not the developer I'm talking about. I'm talking about the developer that had success with Gen 1 Amazon Web Services. I want to build an app, and I don't yet know what it's going to be. I want to I spin up a server, I don't want to buy a server. Oh, they got storage and queuing, that's all I need, because I'm not going to go buy a super micro box and host it on my home, or and some hosting provider is going to take too much time. It's going to play with that, the I don't know if that's what the industry is right now with Gen AI, though, John. I, I think a lot of it is people wanting to buy components that they can yeah. just deploy out of the box and be able to, to, to use that. I, I think the developer and the builder part will come. Uh, I, I just think right now, 
there is such an arms race within businesses to get mm -hmm. Gen AI into their contact centers, into their workforce, into their employees, that if you actually went through the process of trying to build it, um, I, and, and understand too, even the developer stuff they were talking about was using Gen AI to help write code faster versus building your own Gen AI, right? Which, you know, obviously NASDAQ's doing that and things like that, but, yeah. I, but, but Amazon is trying to make it, make it easier for customers to deploy. Well, I guess what I'm saying is, is that um, there's two types of developers. Yeah. There's the developers that, are, that need help and do stuff, develop stuff, they work for a company or whatever, and then there's a the startup, entrepreneur. Uh, I'm talking about the entrepreneur. What is oh. the Gen AI use case for an entrepreneur? They're going to see an opportunity and build an app. Yeah. And so I just can't see in the the bedrock and the Arthropics, why, what is Amazon? It seems like a lot of extra stuff to like get around just to do something. And I yet haven't seen that entrepreneurial match yet. Yeah, you're like, talking it's about so the, easy. the incubator developer. Or just, hey, I, wanna, I have an idea. Yeah. I want to build a new Instagram. Or yeah. a new news app that automates news feeds. Or no, I don't think that like was really represented here much. I, obviously, they, those those companies still use Amazon a lot, but you know, Amazon's obviously been uh, trying to bring more of their components together for enterprise. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and look, there's a tipping point here yeah. with cloud. I, I think the large enterprise was really adverse to cloud for a long yeah. time, but um, most of them have all gone in with both feet now. And if yeah. they were adverse to it, Gen AI is the thing that's actually forced them into it, right? It's so. interesting, it's interesting. We're living in a world now where you have entrepreneurship post hyperscalers at full production. Remember, Amazon was just this little cloud that just took advantage of arbitrage from the startups. Now you got startups and all the enterprises using the cloud. So I guess, you know, what I liked about his keynote, which I thought was kind of entrepreneurial, was if I was an entrepreneur, what would I do? I love the mo multiple models interacting. I thought yeah. that was good. And then access to data sources, I thought was a pretty good, good part of the keynote. Um, because at the end of the day, you're ultimately rolling data around if you're a developer. Like, if I'm going to build something cool, yeah. it's probably going to be very enterprise-like. Right? Yeah. I mean, there's no Airbnb from scratch because that's mobile phone on SaaS. Now it has to be in the cloud at some level. To your point, it's not a good comparison to say entrepreneurship in 2005 is a lot different than I don't entrepreneurship know if you can, I, to if you, 2025. No, if you're an entrepreneur, I'm not sure you can do it not in the cloud. Right, um, I just think you, you wouldn't have access to the data, the, the, the scale. Uh, to your point, yeah. you know, roles, building your own VCF stack isn't simple, um, and I'm not sure it's the payback anymore for it. Right, that's that's yeah. really become a large yeah. enterprise thing. I did like the focus on guardrails too, and I think that is something that even entrepreneurs can, can focus on. Yeah. is making sure that AI is being done responsibly, right? And I think that's something AWS is trying to do since it launched. And uh, it's funny because it's using AI to check AI. <laughs> <laughs> right, and uh, uh, um, but I think that's an important part of it is 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 understanding the, uh, the the subtle nuances of what's a good response, what's a bad response, what's a good outcome, what's a bad outcome, and uh, they're, they're trying to build a lot of that checking into their uh, into their models to to make sure that it's safe for customers to deploy, and that's an important part. You know, whenever I talk to customers, they are scared to death right now, John, of uh, almost every CI I talk to says their bosses are hammering them. We have to have an AI strategy, but everyone remembers, you know, early days of <laughs> chatbots and things that didn't go so well. And no one wants to be on the, you know, on CNN as the company that botched their, uh, botched their AI, right? So um, I'm not, you know, the, the responsible AI part of it, uh, uh, piece of it has to be an integrated part of it in order for companies to have the confidence to build. Yeah. Guardrails are going to give a really good good parameters. I think the other thing that I liked was the App Studio. Yeah. To seeing where that goes. What's your take on App Studio? Well, it, it, again, it's it's been built to simplify the, the rollout of Gen AI within apps, right? And so they've got a bunch of connectors now uh, with, with a bunch of other companies. And so uh, this is more of an ecosystem approach uh, for AWS. They've always been good at that. And so uh, I, I think that um, uh, the we're not building these things in isolation, right? We we have to understand how it interconnects with other applications, and I think that's that that was a um, I think the number of partners they had there was uh, yeah. you know was a good proof one for it. I mean, one of the things I think is that um, I want to get your thoughts on this. Rob Stretch and I were talking about this early on earlier in the day before the keynote. Their partners and developers and mainly partners is a real competitive advantage for Amazon. Yeah. Because they own IaaS, and they got the silicon, they got the performance going on, Graviton 4, not shipping, um, the platform as a service. What, what do you see in the partner side? What are you hearing from 
partners. The competency program is starting to see 60 plus people now globally coming in that are saying we are now AI competent and they have a high bar. This is like GSIs. There's a front lines, I want, I want to say general contractor like mentality. Anyone who's built a house or has been involved in construction knows that you hire a general contractor and they bring piece parts together and they get suppliers. And you kind of see a similar trend going on here with general AI where there's a ton of integration and it's not easy yeah. in the enterprise. So you kind of have this new general contractor kind of role. That, You're talking about the reseller partners. The, re, the, you, the, get the, yeah. you get the reseller partners, you got the distributable, the distributors are sworn the resellers, but you also got the GSIs, the global system yeah. integrators. Well, that's right there flowing into Lloyd out here front and center, you got Accenture, you got IBM. Yeah, is huge well that's where Ruba Borno has made a huge difference, right? She came over from Cisco, who's, you know, to me, the marquee partner company, you know, in tech. Right, and she's revamped their partner organization yeah. uh, to be more um, uh, uh, just just create partner value in a lot of different ways. It's not just marketplace, right? And to, to your point, there's there's GSIs, there's VARs, there's things like that that all can yeah. participate in the AWS ecosystem. And I, I I think she's had a huge impact, uh, which I thought she would. I talked mm -hmm. to her when she first joined, and she was really excited yeah. about the the partner opportunity here. It's, it's a clean sheet of paper, but she had yeah. to do some cleanup. They have now collapsed and merged APN with Marketplace. So one team yeah. going to the market with synergies. Yeah, it created a lot of inconsistencies, right? And, yeah. and obviously they wanted everybody in Marketplace, <laughs> but I think, yeah. you know. Not everyone's ready. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's not the only delivery model. Marketplace is fantastic for certain things, and a lot of customers are going to buy from that. Yeah. But a lot of customers prefer the traditional partners, and a lot of them, to your point, especially big enterprises, go the GSI route. And uh, so you got to be able to cater all of those different things. What's your What's your analysis on their ecosystem? Obviously, it's robust, it's vibrant, always has been. If you go to reInvent, reInvent's become the industry show. We were speculating, you know, we're fearful that Amazon, if they become too internal focused, it becomes an Amazon show versus an industry event. What does Amazon Web Services need to do to keep reInvent to be a bellwether industry show, what what specifically around the ecosystem? Is it money making? Is it delivery? What, what what's your analysis of well, ecosystem to, to, viability? To your point, it is ecosystem, right? And it, if they if they do want to reinvent to be the industry show for cloud, not just the Amazon show, um, this is where they they need to make sure they have a steady stream of ecosystem partners. I, I'm I'm hoping Jensen shows up there. We'll see if he gets as much time as he did at HP. <laughs> we'll have the stopwatch out, clock on him. But, so he probably Matt, won't get much time. So what did Matt say on stage? He said, um, "In uh, it, the AWS cloud is the best place to run Nvidia. If that's true, let's start seeing some proof points on that, right? And so if the world's going AI and Nvidia is the centerpiece of that, then that Nvidia ecosystem needs to marry." with the AWS yeah. ecosystem, right? And so yeah. we should see a pretty big dose of NVIDIA at reInvent if they are actually true to that. You, myself, Bob LaLiberté with the CUBE uh, research team have been talking a lot about how networking is evolving yeah. in this new systems architecture. You mentioned NVIDIA, we talk about clustered systems, they call it the AI factory. So you start to see, and Amazon's had this for a while, where the, it's a collection of stuff that makes the system work for the the power that they is needed in generative AI. So that's kind of a general statement, but you know, let's assume that for a second. The characteristics of the network and the characteristics of storage and compute are going to change depending upon what Gen AI is hitting it. So we're seeing that now, and, and, and I want to bring up networking because networking is that last area that's going to impact uh, storage. Doug Gourlay was recently promoted to the our, as the CEO job at Accumulo. That's a storage company. You see the success of vast data. Doug's a networking guy, so yeah. connect the dots. Networking is now a key part of the storage system because you're moving packets into storage and they're going to be doing inference or training. It might have different read-write capabilities. That was once only an ad tech problem or yeah. a finance problem. So now you're starting to see the infrastructure networking. What's your take on this whole systems view? What, I mean, what does your data show you? And what's your opinion? Because you've been covering networking for a while. It's a big part of it. You know, it's, it's funny. When uh, Charlie Jean Carlo, who's also a network person, when he joined Pure Storage, I remember shooting him a text message saying, Charlie, you went to a storage company? Ha <laughs> ha, <laughs> right? What's up with that? Are you ready for retirement, right? And he actually walked me through the thesis, which I've lived with since then, that when you think about AI, this was, and understand, this was seven years ago. Okay? <laughs> exactly. That, I know the AI was coming next, yeah. like I'm laughing already. But he said, in order for AI to really hum, you need fast processor, hence we're moving to GPUs, you need fast networking, right? And Arista, Cisco, Juniper, all those companies are playing that, and you need fast storage. And the three of them have to work in sync in order to make yeah. AI work. If one of those components, right, isn't uh, up to par with the other ones, it's going to be the bottleneck, 
and the money you're going to spend on the other two, you're not going to get your payback. Right. And so how do you get those three things to work together? You have to take a systems approach to it. If you, if you were to actually try and build these things in isolation and hope that they work together, I mean, good luck. We, yeah, I mean, you even look how just with general computing, right? You've got a, you know, slow processor, slow network or whatever. It, it has a huge effect on performance. And then when you, when you raise the stakes to the AI level where the costs are so much higher, right? That yeah. you can't, you yeah. can't. And the stakes too are higher because yeah. business is being bet on it. Yes, you're right. And so I, I think this is where it's going to be interesting to see um, with all the money companies spent on GPU-based systems, if they've indeed made the investments on the storage side and the networking side. Uh, I, if not, I think we could see some pullback on spending um, uh, in, on AI systems while companies try and get the rest of their infrastructure. You know, I was speculating and riffing with Rob Streche, and I'll riff with you for a second. I want to get your thoughts on this. You almost think, like, remember the old days of the old internet, over-provisioning was a big problem. Yeah. And you over provision your network, all out, we overbuilt. There, do you feel like there might be a scenario where people bought too many GPUs and realized, hey, I got, I got to run this on power now. Oh, I'm going to need other stuff. Because what's happening, it feels like there's a frenzy for GPUs. Obviously, NVIDIA stocks through the roof, but I know the software with it, but there's other mm -hmm. factors. Amazon's got a very efficient sustainability uh, ratio. They just hit their seven years earlier than on their sustainability goals today that was announced. So there's some benefit to running maybe GPU service on the cloud if you're using other stuff and then energy mm -hmm. and power become huge. What's your take on this? Is that Am I fantasizing in the wrong direction here? No, I'm, I've been a little worried about that, right? That we overspent on, on uh, GPU systems. We're not really getting the bang for the buck for it because we're not sure how to run them properly. There's nothing wrong with NVIDIA tech, right? It yeah, works great. Of course, right. it has a line, of, <laughs> the line around the corner to get them. But, but I was talking with a CISO or a, a CIO about this, that the, he doesn't want the company to, mis, to use them incorrectly. There's a lot of things you can just use search for, and that's like one-tenth the compute power of, of, um, uh, of Gen AI, right? And so uh, as they try and refine where to use Gen AI, where to use basic search, where to use basic analytics, right? The amount of AI they use might be less than they're thinking, right? Yeah. And so- This if, idle time, basically. Yeah, yeah, so I do think companies have overspent on it, and I am expecting over the back half of the year, I'm not trying to make a stock prediction on NVIDIA or anything. I think, I think Dave Vellante and the team have some data yeah. on idle time, I think, or another entrepreneur. I talked to an entrepreneur about this, and there's kind of a vibe going on in Silicon Valley right now that looks a lot like the server virtualization days, pre-virtualization, where, hey, we have all these servers, and they're not being utilized. Yeah. Let's create a virtualization, virtual server. And not to say that's going to happen here, but managing workloads to take advantage of capabilities is interesting. Yeah, well, ideally, like you think about typical server utilization runs 30, 35%, right? Mm -hmm. If you're spending the money you are on DGX systems and you're running at 30%, I mean, you're wasting a ton of money, yeah. right? And so this is where the industry and the systems approach can actually help companies you know, maximize that utilization. And I, I, I do think it's something to watch for the end of the year. We'll know more at reInvent, <laughs> right, by the time that rolls around. But I do think the industry is at risk of, of seeing a, uh, a, a, a pullback on spend. Z, it's great to see you. Thanks for the keynote analysis and extra commentary. Z is Carvalho here on theCUBE covering AWS Summit in New York City. It's our pop-up CUBE. I'm John Furrier, the host. Got more coming. Got a lot of great guests coming. Matt Wood, we got some customer examples, partner examples from Amazon. Uh, web services team here showing some great product. We've got some, some hot startups as well, so stay with us.